Thank you very much. And I really wish that some of those competencies would have been around in 2010 when we actually started the rather in insane journey that we took with, uh, with library publishing. Um, I guess to I guess reflect quickly on our, on our first keynote, this is, I suppose, the library trying to publish. Um, I'm, I'm, so hopefully I've got some good things to say about that. I, I'm also slightly worried because I've used the word sustaining and sustainability in this. Um, but I am going to explain what we mean by that, so, um, because I agree with the point that was made. Um, right. So, just, just very quickly, uh, the University of Huddersfield Press, um, we, we relaunched in 2010, so we've been going five or six years now. Um, just very quickly, just in case you've never heard of the University of Huddersfield, um, we are in the north of England, we're sort of halfway between Manchester and Leeds, in the hilly, thank you, in, in, um, in the hilly bit in the middle. Um, the, the press itself, um, as we put there, it's primarily open access. I'll explain that in a second. Um, we publish scholarly monographs, peer-reviewed journals, uh, and also sound recordings. Um, I'll skip through this very quickly. It's, I think, similar uh, drivers and principles to almost every library-led uh, new university press that's, uh, that's come along in the last few years. Um, it was partly, and it actually began as a reaction to the scholarly monograph crisis. Um, fund the mandates, uh, and also to support early career researchers as well. Um, the principles, um, and vanity publishing has already been mentioned uh, today, we're very clear. It has to be high quality, it must be peer reviewed. Um, we want to publish open access, um, and we pretty much are, as I'll, I'll come on to. Um, it's completely managed by the library. Um, unfortunately, when, when people ask at Huddersfield, uh, ask our library director to uh, say, so, so who's, who's the press? She turns around, points at me, and says, him. Um, at, at the moment, it is. Um, we have up there the business model. It's scholarly communication, not profit. The reason why I've highlighted this, and I'm going to come on to it in some detail in a second, um, we then tagged on the line with all surplus being reinvested into the press. Now, that sentence doesn't actually make sense if you think about it. Um, if we're making no profit and then we're reinvesting surplus back into the press, we've got a problem with the business model, which is what I'm going to come on to in the next few minutes. Um, just very quickly, um, since 2010, we are pretty small. Um, we've published 12 monographs. We have been fully open access since 2014. Everything we've published since then has been open access. So half of those monographs uh, are open access. Uh, it's the fairly standard uh, PDF on, on open access. And then we do uh, very small print runs which are available in, in all, the usual, all the usual places. Um, open access journals, uh, I actually spoke about this in LPUB in 2012. So I'll refer you to the paper, which rather bizarrely is dated 2011 um, on that one. But we publish seven journals. We've got another three coming this year. Almost everything is in the humanities and social science. Um, there is a journal coming online which is in um, is applied science, but, but the rest are all um, humanities and social science. Um, most of the journals are led by um, early career researchers. They're very much practitioner research journals. The bit that isn't open access, um, I am, strangely enough, uh, at the moment, I appear to be the head of a record label. Um, that record label is in contemporary music, so I've pretty much reduced the interest to about two, two or three hundred people uh, around the world. But it's, uh, it's published by our Centre for Research into New Music, and they publish CDs and DVDs. Um, so that's the bit. That, that is not open access at the moment, although we have a paper on an idea about how to make it open access, but we have to discuss that. Um, just to, to, to give you an idea of why, why we're doing this, this is one book we published in uh, October 2013, uh, Noise in and as Music. It is a book about m noise as music. Um, which means 85 copies is pretty much an international bestseller in that area. Um, I, I think our authors probably knew most of the people who, who bought that. Um, it was 
published on open access from the beginning, and I checked at the weekend, and it's had about three, three and a half thousand getting on now uh, downloads uh, since then. So that's the point. That's the scholarly communication. Um, very quickly, um, we have a, a nice story about that in, in the fact that a professor at the University of Illinois got in touch with Huddersfield, and I think he had seven or eight PhD students who all referenced this book, and they all said the only reason they found it was because it was open access. Uh, Huddersfield and Illinois are now talking to each other about potential visits, collaboration, so that's, that's the nice thing. That's, that's the thing that we, we set out to do. At the time, we set out to do it without any plan whatsoever, which is what I'll, I'll come on to. Um, just quick thing there, we, we, again, we know it's, it's worldwide, um, the, uh, the access. So the business model, back to this um, statement where we say we're going to invest surplus. Um, that is clearly unsustainable. Um, if we carry on with open access, we, we can't do that. The issue is, and I think, um, like I say, we've been going five or six years, it's really been a running pilot for, for five years. Um, like many presses, and, and if you have a look at the literature, I mean, this has been brought up in, in the States and, very, and, and, and in Europe. Um, most of the presses like, like ours developed as, uh, without any business plan. Let's do this, let's start publishing open access. Um, the trouble is, if you then become successful, and, and whether, and it depends how you uh, define success, but we think we're moderately successful for our size, you've then got scalability issues. Um, that's the, that's the issue that we're currently looking at and what I've got some more information on. Um, there was a report to the American Association of Research Libraries by Hahn in, in 2008, which actually, and it's only one paragraph in this big report, mentions two levels of business plans, um, program level and publication level. Now, what um, we'd been doing, along with most other presses, was we hadn't got a program level plan we had a publication level plan. Someone came along with a book, we published it. Um, so we were just literally lurching from one publication to the other. Um, then we started getting interest from lots of academics. Um, and then you get to these sustainability and scalability issues. We want to have everything on open access, but then costs come in, staffing comes in, um, we are, as a press, only as successful, really, as our last book. Um, we don't want to make any mistakes, and there are an awful lot of people out there who want university presses like ourselves to fail. Um, we don't want to be accused of vanity publishing. We need to get that process right. So it's, uh, it's all areas that, that us and I think a lot of presses need to, uh, to look at. So, yeah, we were very worried that we would become a victim of our own success uh, if we carried on without any program level planning. Um, so if I'm, if I'm the press, and I have, as was said, quite a few other jobs as well, um, it's difficult to support our authors. We, we've got uh, journals that have been running uh, four or five years that really need reviewing, need planning, and it's very difficult to spread everybody um, very thinly. Um, the reason why we weren't completely open access from the beginning was we were playing with the funding models. We were seeing what, what we could do. Um, and each one has its own um, strengths and weaknesses. Um, if we can get publication level planning or program level planning in, then we can start doing publication level planning and we can start to grow and we can, we can have a, a, a proper vision. So, as many presses, we've plumped for what I'm going to call the, the institution funder pays model. Um, and what we did in 2015 is I took a paper to the um, University Press editorial board, which is chaired by the deputy vice chancellor of the university and has heads of research, deans of schools, senior researchers on. Um, we proposed an extra post, uh, a 0.6 post, um, and proposed that the library paid when you combine sort of bits of my post and that post, around £40,000 a year uh, pledged from the library to support that. Uh, we also had a go at a cash flow and profit forecast, which is interesting if you're not planning to make any profit. Um, but essentially, we, we sort of put forward and said we will we'll grow by two journals a year, 
will be publishing up to five books a year by 2019. Um, here are the recurrent costs that we know. Here are you know, various other things. And we actually came out with a very low figure of 15,000, which is what we wanted from, from the university. And that would allow complete fee waivers for, for everybody, no APCs for journals, which we've never charged anyway, um, fee waivers for, for books. Um, just quickly, some of those costs, we, we think it costs about 4,000, three to 4,000 pounds to publish a monograph, and I put in there that I think UCL have come up with a similar figure. Um, I know nobody can read that, but if, if you want to publish with Palgrave Open for exactly the same thing, it'll set you back £11,000. You can see the profit margin in there. Um, so we meet the costs. We have maybe print-on-demand copies, allowing us to sell them at uh, £25 a copy, we think. The people we are selling the books to are the ones who still want print. We have to offer print. For, for those scholars. Um, and we might sell 70 books, and that might bring a bit, of, a bit of money back in, but that's the surplus. We've identified the surplus, and that, we hope, will give us sustainability and allows us to innovate as well. We want to get beyond the PDF, but without, we need some investment to be able to do it. Journal costs we publish via the repository cost £750 to set up a landing page. That's the only cost. Um, and then we've got some recurrent costs for the various memberships as well. So what we really did with this sustainability report was we wanted to tell the university what the long-term benefits were, and we're really pushing that the long-term benefits are not how much do we make for selling 100 books. And I know I keep sort of saying about this, but it's amazing how whenever you mention a, a library-led press to any senior management in, in any university, they immediately come back with, so how much money will you make from the books? They're still convinced there's money to, to be made. Um, if we did that, you know, we're back up to the 80, 90 pounds um, for a book. We don't want to do that. So we're saying, well, that's not the argument. What the, the value is, is the reputational value and the benefit there is to the university. And, and uh, now there are lots of people who have said, we'll do that. But what we've done is we've attempted to actually show what that value is and how we then can become sustainable. Um, the research excellence framework, for those of you who don't know, is a lovely process that everybody in the UK has to go through every five or six years. Uh, it's if, yeah. I'm using ranking in here because we have to talk to the people who like ranking, so we have to use ranking. It's, yeah, no, I'm not going to go there. Talk to me over lunch about how awful the research excellence framework is to, to go through. Um, but basically, there are 36 different units of assessment, one of which is music, drama, and the performing arts. Um, we've published a number of music. We've got CDs, we've got music books. The university put in 100 research outputs in, in that particular unit, 11% of them, so 11 of those outputs, included a press publication. Um, quite often for music, it's a portfolio, so there'll be a book, there'll be a score, there'll be something else. But the press was involved in, in 11 uh, of those. There were three books involved and a number of CDs. Um, Huddersfield came fourth in that particular league table. I could have shown another one where we came first or second or third, depending on which league table, but I went for the, the modest one. Um, we, we, we showed that because we were saying, well, um, you know, it's, it's a good area. We did very well. 44% um, was uh, of that was, was called world leading. The reason why I'm mentioning that is that's where the funding comes from. The QR funding in the UK comes from the REF scores. Um, and we, what we've done is we've looked at that and we've said, well, actually, £82,500 a year comes from that funding into the music department. So, therefore, or, or, or sorry, the press, it's more than that. The press outputs, that 11% is worth £82,000. One book, Shibusa. Uh, entirely funded by a funder, brought in £7,500 to the university. And the noise in and as music only cost £2,000 to, to, to publish. It's brought in £15,000 this year. That's what we're saying. That's where our sustainability is. Um, 
And the outcome of that has been great because we've actually got money for the next two years from the university. So we've got, because that 15,000 um, is, is, uh, doesn't seem a lot until you ask the university for it. And then they say, that's a lot. And then we, hopefully we can put these figures out and say, well, actually, it's, it's an investment. It's not a subsidy. We don't like the word subsidy. It's an investment for the university. Um, very quickly to finish off, um, that's kind of where we are, and that's what we're looking at sustainability. But sustainability is also part of collaboration. There's a 2012 Spark report which recommends that university presses um, collaborate. The problem is in the UK, we have no idea who the university presses are. Um, a paper in, tw in 2004 thought there were 17. Um, getting rid of the seven big ones, which we don't talk about, um, we think there are probably 12 in the UK. Um, but there's a, there's a GISC funded project um, looking at this, um, which we're trying to identify the different, the different presses and learn what their motivations are and actually find out who is coming. Um, that survey closed on Monday, and I can tell you we've had 42 responses. Um, the, there are about 12 presses that have said they're running in the UK. I haven't done the analysis between Monday and today. It's a different 12 to the 12 we thought. Um, and there's another 12 that say they might, they're planning to launch in the next five years. So we could be, you know, 20, sort of 24, 30 universities out of about 150 in the UK could have presses within the, within the next um, five years. Now, I've put that up there to tempt you because I'm not going to talk about that. I've done. Uh, you have to come to Libra and Helsinki to know more about that particular um, survey. But again, it's all part of the sustainability. Um, and we're going to publish that one in Libra quarterly as well. So uh, that's it. Thank you very much. So, thank you, Graham. And again, I'm amazed <laughs> so am <I. laughs> how well you kept to the time. Maybe it's because of my alarm clock standing here. So, that leaves us time for questions. You alluded to... Uh, thank you. You alluded to people not wanting you to function. Could you be more explicit? Sorry, go. You alluded to some people not being terribly pleased with your functioning. Could you be more uh, I, I, I mean what, what um, well, I suppose the term is legacy publishers. We've, we've already used at the, this conference. There, uh, there are certain people with vested interest who would prefer the university presses didn't, uh, didn't sort of rise up. Um, I probably just to be slightly controversial, say the same publishers that announce that they make a loss on their monograph publishing. Um, so uh, I think there's, there's, there are issues there, yeah. We had similar issues in Göttingen. We have a university press as well, run by the library. It's a very similar model. And we had problems with a local competitor. And that local competitor was actually living really well of the university because the university was basically paying everything and they had a profit already before the first book was in a bookshop. bookshop. So we see that there's a tension of, um, yes, some larger commercial publishers claim that they make a loss on their monographs program, but um, European scholars are totally used to the fact that they have to bring in uh, finances in order to be published, especially when it's the peer-to-peer -peer communication. And that I feel is, uh, is uh, where the university presses really seem to be a threat not to the large five, but maybe to some that had been living really comfortably of the subsidies that authors bring and editors. Other questions? Thank you, that was really interesting. Um, I was very impressed by how your sustainability model is, is now working. Um, but I just wanted to ask you, um, as the popularity of the press increases, and, and it deservedly so, um, is there going to become an issue of scalability where you're actually turning down publications for journals, even for monographs, because you don't have sufficient staff to, to cope with it? Are, are you going to end up in a sort of cherry-picking situation which we all hate? I suppose the honor, honest answer to that is I, I hope we get there. <laughs> that would be nice. I suppose that's when the next paper goes into senior management on sustainability. Um, 
we, we, we shall see. Um, like, like many presses our size, we haven't done an awful lot of marketing within the university. In fact, that's what the new post will do, uh, because we've been too worried <laughs> to, to get into that situation. I think, um, yeah, if we, we may have to, I'm, I'm not sure. It, it depends. We, we have put those fairly modest growth um, forecasts in there. Um, we know we can handle, well, I, I know personally, as, as, as doing it sort of as 0.2 of my time, we can, we can start three or four journals and publish two or three books a year because we've already done it. So we're, we're being quite, quite modest. There also could be money coming in from funders. Like I said, a number of those books came in from um, the Heritage Lottery Fund, Leverhulme Trust, and various other places. So that wasn't even university money, that was, that was funder money. So yes, we shall see, and, and you know, hopefully we get to that situation, and I'll come back in, in a couple of years and tell you that we've taken over the whole of Yorkshire and, uh, and are moving on the UK. Thank you, Graham. <laughs>